feel free to interrupt me with questions because uh, somebody's going to give me, uh, Thea's going to give me a high sign because I've been known to keep talking way too long. And uh, then I, I, I may th- be through three or four slides and then we'll, we'll wrap it up very quickly. Uh, disruptive views from the online. <coughs> Understand my context because it's going to be a little different than yours. You, you share, we share some things, discussions this morning, but my framework is from a fully online university and a fully online library serving a worldwide clientele. So it, it changes. I don't have many of the worries that John would have, that you all will have, physical setting, security. I didn't have that. So it, it's a different world. It just So if I say things that seem a little weird, it's because I am a little weird. Let's start. I'm a historian, uh, so we need, need a little history. Think about the paradigm that you're in. Uh, we really have the research university, the land-grant schools, are fixed. The ideas are fixed in the 19th century. This is where our model is going to come from. It's going to change. What we see is the German new university movement. The U.S., the well, University of West Virginia is one of the early land-grant schools, right? This model switched from liberal arts to these new scientific fields. It's first engineering and agriculture. History is a new field. Sociology is a new field. Scientific, looking at research methodology. The university as we know it today is formed in in that period. There's another factor down at the bottom. I have a little pointer here. Does it work? Hello. Hello. Oh, there it is. Democratization that happens with the post-World War II GI Bill, and that's really going to be accelerated once we get to the web era. But if we consider this model, please note the academic library is reinvented. Before that, since print indeed, the library had been nothing, really nothing. It's just a place to hold stuff, and nobody cared that much about it. The research university reinvents it. It becomes a central focus on the new campuses, these new state-sponsored schools or places like Hopkins, birth of the PhD. To the main mission, we become a research laboratory, a place that's part of this new model of higher education. Our goal, hey, Alexandria. The library should have everything just in case a scholar needs it. There's some other things to think about. So our framework, this is like deconstruct. Think where you're at first because we're going to need to move forward. The PhD, that degree is new. It brings in publisher parish. Some opportunities. Libraries started a lot of the university presses. It becomes part of our nature. Also storage, right? Who's going to hold these? Who's going to publish them? And the publishing in this case was binding. Professionalization, librarians, this is when you get your degree. Before that, what you? Well, you're an old prof like me who they stuck over in this building and said, sleep over here and don't bother us anymore. 20th century, really, we get cataloging rules. The university libraries really pioneer automation in universities. We're really the first area that has practical use for automation. My shtick is this direct classroom support. Distance, Distance library services, nobody really cared about them. Nobody really cares that much about distance education. Things are going to change. Once you get the web, it's a new paradigm. We've got a revolution that's really in process. Early 90s, again, libraries are in very early. Before the search engines came in, how did you find stuff on the web? Probably went to the library. We had lists. I mean, some of you in this audience probably did this stuff. We became the place that people needed to go to to find information. There was also a special collections focus because the web really evolves on the web, uh, 
the library really evolves on the web through special collections. You know, these outliers and putting up, God, look at this great display. Look at the good stuff I've got. And if I put up enough of it, you probably don't have to come and see me, but that's a problem we, we think about. Turn of the 20th century, boy, physical facilities. The library is literally reinvented. Think of where the library was when most of the people in this audience, I think, started out. It's not the same being anymore. You have an alternative library that's on the web. You don't have to come here. You don't have to come here. Entitlement, nationalism, those fabrics, the things that, that were part and parcel, they're just not, not there anymore. At the bottom here, classroom materials entering the classroom. That's what I'm going to talk about. But I gave a talk at uh, JSTOR, Ithaca, uh, 2008, talking about classroom materials, the role of the library, and the audience literally gasped. There was another librarian from Syracuse who was doing things. That's changing right now. If you look out in the library literature, you're going to see more and more talk about what I'm saying. I think it's going to become the norm, but for a while, you know, we I was one of the pioneers in this. Uh, it was uh, nothing. You wanted to still be in that old research paradigm, dominant. The change, the reinvention that we've seen in physical space and library services knocking down the walls, that's all good. We've got some threats. Research monopoly is gone. Google has kicked our tail. Why come to a library? Google's really, really good. Far from perfect, but really good. And you can see the drop-off, especially, and the scary thing for me is, especially at the doctoral level, at the higher levels. There's competition. People can go out, you can go to the library, the new Digital Public Library of America has a lot of stuff. Why come to this library electronically? Information literacy, which we created, hey, two-thirds of those classes are now taught not by librarians. The campus library, again, is no longer a required research zone. That's a massive transit. And we've got, if you really want to see, you've got Amazon and Google. You've got other players out there who can fulfill most of that Alexandrian idea. The bulk of information lies outside. And guess what? We're not alone. Credo, you can get information reference services. You can outsource almost all of the library. Uh, my friends at McGraw-Hill, they offer a, uh, to faculty, directly to faculty, they'll go right around you guys. You don't need the library. Just come to McGraw-Hill. We'll take care of everything. We'll show you how to teach. We'll, uh, we'll give you everything. Uh, LSSI is outsourcing distance uh, library operations in public libraries. They're going to hit the... The, uh, the market for uh, academics, and we know that other libraries, Johns Hopkins, Indiana, Southern uh, Alabama, a number of libraries outsource their, their collections. Uh, this new mobile master's, mobile bachelor's degree, uh, that's, uh, oh, who did this? Uh, a company that used to make electronic uh, textbooks supposedly for free has now gone into this market and saying, look, we've got 30,000 documents. Here's your canned education. You don't need the library. External competition from the uh, for-profit sector in a time when businesses are starting to dominate the university. Also have, my baby, new university model. Nationalism. So part of the reason the library was able to grow, the academic library in the 19th century, was it's a monument to the state. We've got a new time, post-enlightenment. People are thinking the industrialization is going to go on. Now, nationalism is no longer there. The state doesn't seem to need the library anymore or the university. We can cut those funds. 
We don't care. I went to Indiana, so it's really bad for me right now. And I'm from Louisiana, so it's even worse with Jindal. Uh, horrible things happening. Kansas, I mean, you can, you can go through them. Business interests have risen really to the dominance of, in most universities, it's a business model. It's no longer an academic, faculty-centric, becoming more and more business. That's pragmatic reality. It's anniversary of Machiavelli. Got a different game ongoing here. Uh, also have, with the onset of the web, remote classrooms. Teaching that's no longer com confined. The lecture, do you really need it? You can have asynchronous education. And new people. Strange instructional developers come up. They hadn't been around. Do you really trust those people? IT. Now, I don't know how IT is here, but in almost every place that I'm at, uh, there is a love-hate relationship with IT. Because IT acts like high priests. Right? They have the control, and they want to control even though they don't know the product. But they do have a point of control. This is internal. I'm just pragmatic. What's there? And online, for profit. Our focus is non-traditional students. That's 80% of the client base out there. It's really convenient. There's a lot of bad stuff about the for-profits. One of the things that they've done, though, is bring a needed focus on metrics, on the student. Some of you, John, you probably remember back in the, you know, you weren't supposed to, to really teach students. You're supposed to get research. Any, any faculty member who actually learned how to teach? Just not there. That game has changed. We're trying, we're thinking about student retention. I like that part of it. For the most part, for-profits are a bunch of scum buckets. Uh, not the place I'm at, of course, because it's in West Virginia. So what happens with the library in this shift? You start to look out and the business people in charge of most universities start to ask some questions. <coughs> oh, sorry, went too fast. Basically, how much is it going to cost? What's your impact? Can you show it's having an impact? No longer a sense of entitlement from nationalism. Now we're at a time when you need to prove. You need to prove if you want to grow. I mean, the library, or at least special collections, are going to be around. The rest of you all, hey, tech services, come on. If it's electronic, I've outsourced that. I don't need you. You best find something you can do. Cataloging, well, I don't know if it's going to be the strange new cataloging rules that we have, or BISC, the business, or I'm sorry, the, you know, the publisher's data set, which is rising. We may be, you know, the old Mark stuff may be totally gone and obviated because publishers are doing something else. So this is my case study from the edge. We're West Virginia's disruptors. It's an open university. So, you know, there's no hurdles in getting in. If you've got a high school degree, you're going to get into this school. Non-traditional, the real differential for the American public university system is the American military university designed by a former Marine for people in the military. Transportable, you, you reassign places. And it's, it's good. It really knows what it's doing. Fully online, asynchronous, no, no real lectures. We can capture lectures, but you don't get that give and take. It's not going to be there. It doesn't need to be there. The student works intensely with the materials and comments. There'll be questions. Uh, I taught in, in Italy at uh, the University of Perugia, the new university. It was from 1256. You know, students had left Bologna because they, they fired their profs and they just sort of went and, and built a new one. Their students, well, every class started officially 15 minutes late because no Italian would be there at the time that the class was assigned. The students really didn't have to come to class. They did intensive readings. You come back out. There could be a written test, but more than that, at the end of the class, 
there's an oral exam. And boy, were those people knew their stuff. It was, uh, so in some ways, this is a throwback model. If it's done well, it's hard to do well. Uh, school, when I, when I arrived, has six to 8,000 part-time students, over 100, over 100 countries because of the military primarily. Student-centric, 24-7. Just think where education is now. Students expect to have classes available 24-7. Remember that Saturday morning class that you had to go to? Don't have to do it anymore. It's not scheduled for the professor's convenience. This is everything for the convenience of the student. It's really disruptive for an old guy like me. I mean, I've, I've got to pay attention to my students. I need to listen to them? What a horrible thought. Uh, no need, you know, we don't care about parking. Always a bane around, you know, getting your sticker and all this stuff. Monthly semester starts. Those horrible times of trying to get the right class in the right slot are gone. Monthly starts, not two or three times a year. Affordable, they're going to raise, I think they're going to raise tuition, but for 15 years, it was $250 a credit hour, plus, and the important part here is plus a grant for undergraduate course materials. That means you can get a bachelor's degree for 30K, period. That's, uh, that's not bad. AMU, APU, uh, this is weird branding, but some people didn't want a military university on their diploma, so yeah, you make it an American public university. It's the same thing. What I entered was a competitive but really flexible bureaucratic setting. That can be different at, it's, it was so new. Nobody really knew what they were doing, didn't have a lot of traditional academics. That's far different than what you all face. Because you've got a bureaucracy and you've got faculty, you've got people who've been around for a long time. They can be great, but the power and that's for, for you to work out. You know who you can work with, who you can't. Uh, I was brought in really for regional accreditation to build this online library. Just before that, they'd moved, they'd made the brilliant move to go from Virginia to Charlestown, West Virginia. I don't want to tell you how many people have tried to visit us in Charleston, <laughs> but I was letting most of the vendors know, no, don't go there. It's, uh, it's by D.C. Uh, that's for the Higher Learning Commission to get accredited. The southern branch, southern folk accreditors were then almost impossible, largely because they demanded a strong physical library, and we couldn't do that. Indeed, the library was a key factor in uh, ensuring accreditation. Preliminary visits, there were 12 points, eight of which involved research. We got a new provost, this funky guy, my brother from another mother, Dr. Frank, Frank McCluskey. Hegelian philosopher who was also a volunteer fire captain. Interesting guy. University president, Wally Boston, Wallace Boston, uh, really liked the library. And I mean, these are my friends, right? These are people, Wally Frank and I took a, a road trip down here. There's a really nice wine bar. Wally buys good wine. So I have fond memories of Morgantown. Just, uh, there was a Pinot Noir, only cost $100. One of his, oh, so good. They authorized funds. We had a five-month construction window to build a library that could get through accreditation on the upcoming visit. Some baseline facilities was already fully online. One support staff, one part-time librarian. Minimal collections. We had a tutorial center. Only about 3,000 monthly visits. So that's not a lot of, lot of traffic. Phase one, my audience is accreditation. Your audience is always accreditation. You have to keep accreditation. Normally with an established library, you don't worry that much about it because you've got all the, all the stuff. Uh, constructed the website. I built this, right? 25 pages in uh, 
90 days that I put together. Collection development, this is song and dance. We mapped the enhancements where we needed to go to research and to department needs, adding granularity. Why? Because accreditors like to see that. If you note the accreditation and new accreditation standards coming out, what's being discussed, the library is not mentioned. We've lost out already there. We are not in with the accreditors. You need to be in with the accreditors at the national level. Uh, Ebook titles, yeah, Solanet, yeah, we just went in and just bought a lot of packages, whatever I could get my hands on, that looked good. You need to get the numbers up. Faculty involvement, please. You need your faculty involved, or at least to reach out to them. And then, and this is all the accreditation game, student evaluation. Regular surveys, making sure you're evaluating what, what was out there. Our yeah, metrics, as you know, are not that good, but we had needed to show it. This is all show and tell. Also added a proactive vi vision of the library. We put information literacy as a goal within the accreditation, and then said, hey, who can do that? The library. Library goes into mandatory faculty training for teaching online courses. We were talking about that this morning. Hey, this is, this is your hook. You want to get them whether young, eager, make them friends. I asserted authority over copyright. Copyright in an online environment, hey, the legal, if you see some of the lawsuits, and it's parallel, these are two sides, ADA, 508 compliance. Librarians are really good at monitoring this stuff. And at promoting not the publishers and the authors, but the good of the university. You know, you're not an apologist for other people making money. You're an apologist for your students saving money. Library is a marketing brand. Uh, you're trying to recruit students, trying to get it in. Having a great library is a sine qua non of a good university. Sell it. Don't, you know, we're too nice. We're too calm. You, the library needs to be, again, a hallmark of a great university. Place of tradition. History's not bad. Wrap yourself in that. Faculty know that librarians are nice people. We're not threatening like the IT, the new instructional developers. We're part of, you know, we've been in the family for a while. You can use it. After we got accreditation, a nice reset, uh, hypergrowth. This is weird. I don't think any libraries experienced that. We went to, uh, now it's like 115,000 students. That equates to 45,000 FTE. So it's good to be here in the second largest university in the state. Not even close people. You've got about 30,000. It's 45,000 FTE. But the growth within a decade. Uh, number one, past the University of, uh, of Maryland, College Park, or University College, rather, which had been number one in the military market. I studied with them in Germany back in, uh, in an earlier time. Walmarts. The library, I was able to immediately add, part of my negotiations were to add some librarians and then figure out metrics to add more along the time. We certainly got library collection development as part of, if you want to build up a new program, you better have a library support. In a for-profit world, you, you don't think about these things, so you can't be shy. And then we started to evaluate, where were we? Because we had taken on a research, the traditional model, and adapted to it. Did that serve the role of a teaching university? In your case, would it serve really serve the model of a 21st century new type of university. Research as well as teaching. We, we weren't a monument. There's no reason to come. I didn't have the big building. I didn't have, oh, I love your foyers and stuff. Good, stu good space. Just in case collection development doesn't make any sense. Holding these huge multi-million dollar collections, why? Why invest? I couldn't afford it anyway. We had an audience. Nobody knew us. 
we need to reinvent and think about reinventing the library to reach the full mission of the university. We noted that you can go through and I, in my book you actually I go through and sort of pick out various areas where I no longer need to think about them. You know, I can take that off my table. John still needs to think about them, but I didn't because of the absence of physical. Everything, though, in the library has to be recast. There's not an area of library services that is not touched by the web revolution. Now, you can do that willy-nilly. It's going to happen to you. Can you get out ahead of it? Can you use this opportunity to push the library ahead and to get you to hold on until you retire? See, the sound file actually worked. That's good. <coughs> that was to wake people up in the middle of the talk, I figured. Sustainability narrative. The word sustainability needs to be locked in. We look to, to leverage. I used historical, institutional, financial. These are pretty obvious. The historical, hopefully you've, you've caught on using the tradition being Machiavellian, looking within the institution and playing that game. You can't just lay back. You need to be a player. That's what John's role is, and you know, getting the president and other people, getting key faculty members, others involved. But it's also the staff's role in reaching out and making sure that you have ties, close ties, with faculty members, showing the worth of the library. Financial? Yeah. We never had to do this before. But you really need to speak to the bottom line. What what does it cost the university to have you? What is the cost-benefit analysis? And finally, pedagogical. So a lot of what I think I'll be doing here over time is talking about saving students money. But that's a minor part. It's really starting to say, what is the University of West Virginia's education going to be? Course materials are important. The library is important to teaching. How do we transit into that 21st century? If you can't do this, if you can't show that you're a value, you probably don't belong. I mean, you belong for archaeological reasons. You've got great collect, you know, uh, Rockefeller stuff, that good materials. No. Got to be part of the full mission of the university. And guess what? You can do a great job. There's a missing part here. So we heart, you know, what I did is started to look for online universities. You look around, online classroom, the library wasn't there. Course materials, boy, crazy marketplace, especially 2005. Uh, textbooks were just PDFs, horrible. E you know, 508 compliance issues up the yin yang. You know, if you remember, you know, two column things, the JAWS readers won't really work with that. Thinking about that. Textbook dependencies. Publishers said, oh, they were so good. You know, originally, World War II, they stepped in with the, the growth of GIs coming back. And they filled a niche because the, the universities were growing so large. Now they've really started to dominate, build dependencies. Makes it easier. Here, here's your, fat, here's your free textbook. You know, and it's set for 8, 12, 6, whatever you want. I'll make your life so easy. Just buy this. Don't think about it. And guess what? These are <coughs> professors like me. I didn't know how to teach anyway. I needed some help. And the products are good. I mean, Pearson, McGraw-Hill, I mean, these are really good products. Smart people. But does it speak to the University of West Virginia? It's homogenized. It's hard. You can't market from it by using a uh, Cengage textbook doesn't say anything about you, doesn't say anything about the unique nature of your various departments. So there's, an, uh, we thought, an opportunity there. And then, even though they have great products, hyperinflation. Uh, what happened in the publishing industry, starting pretty much with evil Elsevier, ah, boo. Uh, <laughs> but then most of the publishing, major publishing companies, textbook publishing, the big four, big five, are taken over by financial interests. The moral campaign crusade that was on to help the young men and women after World War II goes away for profit. 
Average textbook now in print is about $110 used. It's about 90 and that keeps growing at, high, at, at a higher rate. They're making a ton of money. Pearson, 40%. Uh, McGraw-Hill, I think, was 38% or something. Profits on their textbook side. They don't need it. They're rich enough. I don't, I don't have any obligation to them. I don't care about them. I care about my students. And we were shipping all of ours, often overseas. Uh, MBS it involves uh, significant charges like $10, figure $10 added on to all those other costs. So we made a business case. And this is stuff that maybe will work for you. It's a three-part approach. The last one, library is what we'll be talking about as I wrap as the rest of the talk. Other things that I'd like to talk about or that we may want to engage electronic textbook bookstore. So I wrote a white paper and said, this is what I want to do. We're an online university. Shouldn't we have all electronics materials? And besides that, it's going to save you a lot of money. And if you wanted to save, you still wanted to be able to afford sending students uh, their textbooks, making this, that free student benefit, you've got to do something. Chaotic marketplace, we also ran into over a dozen different reading experiences the platforms, things to think about, but really heavy negotiations. Stuff I know John's joined this consortium, but the library has to start swinging its financial muscle. It's a, we are a big, big business. The mainstay of academic publishing is the library. The library, therefore, as consumer, also as publisher, but as consumer, has an interest in not just taking all these charges. And you can swing deals. Uh, McGraw-Hill, uh, I got so a discount off of print at 55% level, and I told them, fine, as soon as I hit a million dollars, put it in the contract, I want to go back in to renegotiate. Hit that within six months, went in. In the meantime, they had a hard time converting because I had to send materials overseas. Uh, couldn't be just cloud delivered, had to have delivery onto the computers because people in Afghanistan may not have a lot of time on their computer or on the web. Uh, they'd messed up really badly. So I got a 53-foot fishing boat, caught a lot of Spanish mackerel, and got them down to 35% at the end. But that took a lot of fighting, a lot of negotiation. Right now, APUS pays no more than $35 for any textbook, any publisher. can do it. It's negotiations. Yeah? Am I understanding you correctly? You're buying textbooks for the students? We buy. And that's the, that's the difference here. Yet you can still swing. It, there's a tension. The university bookstore is a profit-making center. Typically 25% profit goes into the school or <laughs> if the school realizes it should be. E-book sales, you'll get anywhere from 6 to 10 or 11% markup that can come back to the school. So there's You've got to think about that. If you're really thinking about your students, then you use your economic muscle and say, no, we're placing a large order. I don't care who's paying, you know, it's through us. <coughs> Let's talk. And if you think of every major university, we can set the prices. We don't have, we don't have to put up with inflation. You know why? Because you've got five major companies out there putting out pretty much the same product. So if your faculty are in agreement, now we can negotiate. And these guys, they save a ton of money. They don't have to pay storage charges. They don't have the production values. They're making a ton of profit. With the print, because of used book sales, industry standard is seven reuses of a book. It's probably more like nine or 10. But start doing the multiples. So they're making a lot more money because the ebook licensing that's one-to-one. -one. There's no resale value there. That market's been wiped out. It's to their advantage. And you tell them, I know this. You know, back off. You're still making more profit. My gut is that there's profit for them down to the 20% level, say roughly $20. You could get them down. And we were dropping, dropping down. You want win-win situations. But it's using that economic might and realizing 
that we're not just passing off our fiduciary responsibility to our students and letting somebody else rip them off. That's not what a university is about. You need to take care of them. So it was more upfront for us because this was my opportunity for the library, but still major. We also, uh, I had an emphasis, well, let, let me go through. So the bookstore, the other one, the smallest, and the most intriguing one, uh, and we'll talk more offline probably about this, was creating an e-press. When I went on sabbatical, unfortunately, the provost decided that uh, she could go in and make textbooks. That's really hard. Really, really hard. So the OER, the Open Educational Resources model, that you see, so there are a number of free online textbooks, I, I didn't advocate that. And I had, when I came back in, I had to pull because the quality wasn't there. My fac your faculty may be capable of doing it. Mine wasn't. But anthologies? Anything before 1923, why are you paying for it? You can put that together. What we did is I had a faculty, you know, faculty member, here, here's your course, you're using, you know, it's Renaissance literature. Add some learning objectives to it. Put a little intro. You've got a publication. And we'll make it free. We'll keep it. It will be open access. It doesn't have to be, but in our case it was. And my president, even though it's a for-profit university, said, yeah, anything we do. So thinking niche that you could publish, another part of the niche were specialized textbooks or, that could be branded for the university. So you, see, you probably know about special cover editions that, you know, where you cut and paste. But what I was thinking about was like that English 101 class. We've got a reader and you've got to do certain assignments. Shouldn't that relate specifically to the University of West Virginia, to that context? We were paying for, we had the university recognized four academic style manuals. I commissioned faculty to make chapters for each of those style manuals and had librarians along as research assistants and editors. Savings? Oh, only half a million dollars a year. Adds up. So, uh, Brandable applications, thinking about those, but certainly anthologies of non-copyrighted materials makes a lot of sense. Or if you're in the open access movement, your faculty are publishing out there, do they want to compile this material together? And then with uh, POD, print on demand, you can still make a little money if you want, or you charge if the students want a print copy. You know, Amazon, there's a number of services where they can go and print and pay for it. I'm going to guess what it costs to, to print a 250-page black and white book. Anybody? Ten bucks. Four. With handling and stuff, I'd sold them for ten. And these are nice. I mean, they're permanently bound. Yeah. <laughs> Color, the prices goes up rather dramatically. There are alternatives if the student really needs it, and you want to think about the student as client and what, what they're doing. Uh, <laughs> library theory, theory, two parts here. One is research remains. This is my Chris model. Because I'm an academic, so you've got to, yeah, got to think a little about theory. Uh, research remains, but the emphasis on classroom engagement. Proactive and a massive inversion. It's no longer the collection, it's the librarians. It's the librarians. In an online environment, students aren't going to be coming into here, I know that. We've become very librarian-centric, tailoring and working with individual departments, getting granularity for the university. That, I think, is the future. It creates a new role for the librarian, not a passive role. It's becoming entrepreneurial. The flexibility, thinking about the web proactively. It's a new medium. It's dynamic. We don't have all the answers. We're not even close. Extending into the LMS, into the learning management system is vital. You've got your own electronic presence. It needs to be in this new classroom environment. 
Remember, the campus is spread out. So you've got, you don't have walls anymore. Best have a place. Targeting faculty. And faculty still are key, even though they're being attacked by the business interests. But those are, you know, who, which faculty can you work with? <coughs> Providing really good services, things that will help them so that they succeed. They succeed, you succeed. The university succeeds. Marketing to students, letting them know. Because with Google, why should they come here? How do you get out to them? Actually, you market through the LMS. You market through social media that they are going to, not because you've put up a nice Facebook page. They're not going to come. Where are they? You need to have a presence. Historical narrative? That's just because I'm an archivist and I'm really... <laughs> also, it's good for working with development and anytime you can bring uni money into the university, people will like you. Augmenting scholarly drives. The pedagogy, again, we're really down to teaching, thinking about not the libraries in title, but the, uh, the library as part of a huge pedagogical concern, educational concern that's moving into a new century, paradigm shift. Uh, we map, I mapped every course in the curriculum, 1,500 courses. And we're doing a few things. We're looking, it's cost-benefit analysis. What's the cost of a textbook? What textbooks are being used so I can look at other, other products? What's the enrollment in that class? Multiply it out. Does the class fit a textbook model? Especially the undergraduate, you know, like the gen ed classes. It may well. That's for bargaining. That's for negotiations. Is it something, especially upper division classes, where the library could play a role? Is it something where the e-press could step in and, you know, an anthology? Are there problems? You'll see, uh, like, down here, uh, must run through. That's because I had a contract, so I'd, I already know that we've contracted for a book. Didn't need to do it. Yeah, I, I, I don't worry about that one. Setting up, this is business practices. You know, it's business 101. Cost-benefit analysis, where's my big buck, bang for the buck. More than that, we factored for faculty. Which faculty, which departments can we really work with? Because I don't want to waste my time otherwise. Quick sample. Here's my library in the classroom. It's a place. Uh, we had a new Sakai platform. We changed platforms from an educator system into Sakai. I made sure the library was there, also within each class. And if you had a, a course guide, a lib guide, stuff we'll talk about, then I wanted that to automatically populate the syllabus. Copyright 508. This, by the way, is part of my training, so the fixed resources that come out. Uh, we tied tra faculty training in, but I also added in Sakai when faculty members, and I don't know Blackboard, but if faculty added stuff, they had to declare on copyright. So we added granularity to this, and at the bottom was unsure, contact requested, which went to my staff. I was able to add two staff to handle this information. Going across the entire curriculum, 508 compliant. I mean, you're talking about million-dollar lawsuits if you don't do something. You may have somebody in the university now doing this. If not, great role for a library. Main tactic, mapping to every course, or trying to. Uh, this became a production metric. Much more important than reference questions. Three-year, we tend to have a three-year curricular design. So in, at least in my environment, we knew the courses were going to change every three years. I want something that's living. So every three years, at least, in some of the high-tech courses, it's got to be faster. You want to get in. Uh, not just the library. So if you think of the library as only those things within these walls, you're wrong. For the students, there are no walls. How do you knock them down? Open web as well as deep web. OER, online educational resources. I don't care where the stuff comes from because I'm trying to service a clientele first. Knock down those old walls. Dual purpose, these platforms are for faculty pick lists for course materials. So here's your freebie or low price stuff. We'll help you. And student research, launching pads. 
trusted, vetted resources. This is not just going out onto Google. This says, hey, student, if you want to start, here's a nice spot. Because that Google search, it's probably not weighted for your academic department. We wanted quality and currency. Keeping things up to date. Textbooks are automatically outdated, right? Uh, looking at up-to-date web apps. Trying to, you know, the, the librarians, librarians are great trolling. Finding out what's new, what's out there. Working as partners with the faculty on that. Financial savings. And then we had an embedded librarian options. I liked uh, libraries, librarians, especially in the research methods classes and any intro class. That's where they belong. Unless John can hire like 9 million librarians, you're never going to be able to get in all the classes, so you're going to have to pick and choose. Enhancing online, okay, we were discussing this a little earlier. I, I embedded a research uh, semantic search engine but basically, instead of calling it refer, uh, reference, it was help. And you know where help is? On the web page. It's right there. It's tactile. So you're thinking about your audience, its terms. Uh, usage increased dramatically. We'll show that in a bit. Rewiring librarians. Now, you've got a, a lot of smart people here. Uh, this is pioneering. We had to get people thinking about the transition to born web. As they came online, we still had traditional. Who's your audience? Who's actually looking at this faculty as well as students? Seeking clients. It's really Web 2.0 stuff, going out and, and lobbying to faculty also. With the web, anything you do should, have, should be multi-purpose. If you're doing it for one, it's probably no good. You need to be able to reuse and think in modules. Don't think about this is, here's my task, it's done. No. Network. Borrow. Creative bargaining. You know, borrowing is, is essential in this environment. Uh, this is tough for libraries. We've been driven toward quantity, and uh, that doesn't work. It's the top ten. It's the top five. Can you actually go out home looking at what the people need, not the fact that you... Uh, It'll take about five minutes. Uh, not the fact that you can find nine million resources. It's like a Google search. People don't look at it. Don't regurgitate all the good stuff you found. Your boss needs to reward you for finding good stuff. Vetting. That's what we used to do before the online stuff came in. Search engines are audience. You need to design for that. Design for discoverability. <coughs> Students are going to be using it. Kiss. If it's too complicated, as in you come up and locate your material and there's like five ands down here, or students don't want to see that, they're used to Google. <coughs> Google has won, learn from the masters. Training, looking to infiltrate. You are web construction engineers. No longer is this library fixed. It's not just these rooms. You're going to be building rooms, building services for people, for students with, with a distinct, pa uh, distinct focus. Need to market? This is good. Just bask in what you are. You're compliance masters. You're high touch. Who else is better you know, at getting people through these strange new environments? Reputation management. I mean, the librarians, you guys are cool. You've got to be out there, hopefully publishing a lot of the stuff you'll do in the next few years. Subject specialist. That's more of a concentration needs to be added in normally. Teaching assistants, embedded, web gurus. It's a 12-year-old or it's a librarian. Come on, sell it. Monitoring, doing an active, taking an active role, not a passive reactive role, reacting role within the nature of higher education. Postscript. So I built a business case because I'm talking in a for-profit environment. Y'all are really talking more in an academic environment. It's a different sales area. You, know, you need to speak more to the faculty than I did. I needed to speak to people who, uh, to accountants, to MBAs. Made a case, and uh, we actually got into 
NASDAQ as one of the four pillars. Uh, so this is like you know, selling stocks. Not bad. Hey, the library and ePress actually helped to sell. I wish the <laughs> stock was doing better than it is at this moment. That's a different, different matter. Online library, uh, I had $5 million at a minimum in demonstrable savings that the librarians produced. Now, I've got to write down, this is a ROI, it's actually EBITDA, but we'll say ROI, return on investment. I got $15 back from every, every dollar I paid to the library, for the librarians. John won't be that crass and crude, but uh, I needed to be. Uh, the collective, by 2013, this three-part program saved $25 million. That's not casual. External recognition, yeah, we won a ton of you know, nice awards. Uh, I was the distance librarian of the year for last year. But uh, getting, I think a couple people may have been at the presentation on the embedded librarians at uh, down in uh, Sloan C. IMS Global is the standards maker, and we won a Gold Innovation Award for our course guides. Library metrics. Okay, start to wrap up. One third of the course guides we got actively used in courses. That's got to be a key measure. So I, this was a build it and they will come model. I really, it, it's really hard to get faculty to you know build along with it. The natural tendency is to say I want my faculty partner and and we'll build it together and everything will be hunky dory. That unfortunately doesn't work out that much. But if it does for you, that that'd be great. Holdings we increased by a factor of ten. Staffing, I went from two to 23 librarians. This is the leading core online. I mean, these guys are just great. You can look on the, the website. Their credentials are non-paralleled. Uh, sports staff, so we went from two people to about 40 in an eight or nine year period. So I'm not the size that you all are, but from where we started to where we ended up in a very competitive environment. Statistics. Course guides, uh, this is the only site on the LibGuides platform with over a million hits a year. It's by far the most active. It has the most, the most resources. Reference, hey, what you want to do? Academic libraries are sinking on reference, and I went from 6,000, this is by 2013, to 240,000 queries. Because they weren't going through reference, they were naturally using the query system. Research visits, uh, only 3,000% increase. So you can look at the growth. And here's the killer, guys. Database usage. So you talk about being a research library, you aren't even close to what I do. You're not close. And that should be an embarrassment. We went from, it's like nine, 800 or 900,000 searches a year to over 80 million. Number one user of JSTOR in top 10. So like I compete with the University of Michigan. They don't want to admit that. Uh, with JSTOR, Oxford had, I had two databases. Oxford had the full run of their data, of the JSTOR databases and we blew past them like twice their size. I added a third database. So that's not even complete. Something happens by dynamically reaching out and talking, really going in and working this new paradigm switch. And that's it. Here's my book. 